When the first artist's impressions and mock-ups of the F-35 started surfacing, among the other very innovative design elements, the air intakes stood out for their very particular layout. The F-35 was designed with DSIs or diverterless supersonic intake. In mid-1990s, Lockheed conducted extensive studies on this concept using computational fluid dynamics but also flying a research F-16 plane with modified air intake. Those studies were at the root of the decision of equipping the most technologically advanced aircraft currently in existence with DSIs. And when there is something new in the USA, everybody else immediately pays attention. Like the Chinese, for example. So the SIs are quickly spreading on different projects around the world, a bleeding edge technology which is more than 60 years old. Welcome to Millennium 7 Star, the channel that helps you make sense of military history and military technology. Please stay with me till the end because the stuff that we discuss here are not easily found anywhere else on YouTube. The small town of Guidonia near Rome in Italy has a very particular look. It doesn't look like the usual old and quaint historical place that preserves traces of the history like many Italian towns. No, Guidonia is different. Its architecture is very, very particular. It looks strange, it looks modernist with square and clean cut buildings. The reason is there is a lot of fascist architecture surviving there. It happens because Guidonia was in the focus of one of the face's main staples, aeronautics. Direzione Superiore Studi ed Esperienze High Directorate for Scientific Study and Experimentation Active from 1935 to 1943, born from the amalgamation of various research units, it was the Italian equivalent of NACAS Langley. During those few years it grew very quickly, becoming a very advanced research facility. It could be easily the subject of an entire video, but for our story, what is important to know is that in 1936 a young Air Force Lieutenant, Antonio Ferri, joined the director. Antonio Ferri was a genius and a hero. He was a brilliant student and he joined the Air Force soon after graduating as an aeronautic engineer with outstanding results. His first assignment was obviously at the Directorate where he built one of the first and maybe the most advanced uh, supersonic wind tunnel in the world, well at least at the time. His experiments were widely recognized as groundbreaking. In 1938 he received a prestigious prize from the Italian Academy of Science. At the outbreak of the war he was kept in his position and he could keep he, uh, his research going till the 8th of September 1943, when Italy signed an armistice with the Allied powers. That day his life changed. Documents, a fruit crate full of. The 8th of September Ferry was in Rome and like the rest of the country he was caught by surprise. The entire Italian government and military organization shut down. It was chaos and nobody knew what to do. But one thing was clear at least to Ferry. Guidonia's center was very high on the German list of the planes to acquire control of. He ran back to Guidonia and found the place locked down. The security and the other employees had disappeared. He mastered some colleagues, they broke through the gates and they started smashing equipment and experiments, setting fires, breaking and ruining everything they could. He filled a fruit crate with all his essential documents and left. Italy was in chaos, the Italian forces around Rome were trying a desperate resistance against the Germans now turned enemies, 
so he managed to get into town, pick up his family, sneak out and take them to a safe place in the mountain. Once they were safe, he left to organize the guerrilla against the German. His band managed to deal a few blows to the Germans. He also earned a silver medal for his actions during the Partisan War. After the liberation of Rome in June 1944, his area of operation was surpassed by the Allies, so his unit was disbanded. However, Ferry did not remain out of work for long. In the context of the Operation Paperclip, he was invited to emigrate to the United States to keep going with his research. He moved to Langley, working for the NACA, where he rebuilt and improved his supersonic wind tunnel, improved the visualization methodologies, and operated on many other subjects. He will eventually spend the rest of his life in the United States, where he had a prestigious and outstanding academic career. Of all his career, for our story, we are interested in a patent that he filed in 1955. Patent number US 2990142A, scoop type supersonic inlet with pre compression surface. Look at this, and now look at this. One, two. One, two. Do they have a family look? Do they look similar? Well, they are. They are basically the same thing. The description of the device in the patent leaves no doubt. So, despite what the marketing of Lockheed Martin may say, we have the proof that the device was invented by an Italian in the 50s. That's so satisfying. Basically, everybody forgot about the ferry intake, but Vought. Before its demise, Vought proposed at least two projects using the ferry's intakes. The XF-8U-3 Cruiser 3 uh, was an evolution of the Cruiser 2 that never entered service, used a prominent DSI intake. At a later date, the vote proposal for the lightweight fighter competition featured a DSI intake in a position similar to the F-16. So the DSI intakes are not new and if you want to learn how they actually work, you can watch my video on the JF-17 or just stay here because what follows is an extract containing the explanation. Um, ah, by the way, yes, I had sunburn when I recorded that video. The JF-17 intakes are diverterless supersonic intakes, a simple idea derived from a principle that had been known for decades. The first design and test of working DSI was Lockheed Martin in the early 90s, but since they are relatively easy to copy, they are becoming more and more common and the Chinese really embrace them. At subsonic speeds, air intakes are not particularly complex. The complex geometries that can be seen on fighter jets are there to cope mostly with the high subsonic, transonic and supersonic flight. This subject is vast and it is worth many videos in itself, but now let's try to qualitatively understand how do they work. The main function of air intakes is to recover pressure. That is to turn the airflow kinetic energy into static pressure at the entrance of the engine. The higher the pressure at the entrance, the higher will be at the nozzle, where the subsequent expansion will produce thrust. At high speed, there are two problems that can greatly reduce the pressure recovery. The boundary layer ingestion and, at transonic and supersonic speed, the formation of shock waves. So the boundary layer is a layer of slow-moving air sandwiched between the aircraft's skin and the free flow. Since it is slow moving and often turbulent, it doesn't have much energy to convert in pressure. This is the reason why almost all the jets from the late 50s onward have intakes separated from the fuselage by a slot a few centimeters wide. In this way, the boundary layer and the slot and not the intake. The shock waves form at transonic and supersonic speed. They are thin surfaces where the flow condition abruptly changes across. The flow in front of the shock wave is supersonic, 
while the flow behind the shock is slower and potentially subsonic. The problem with the shocks in respect of the intakes is twofold. One, the more the shock is strong, the biggest the change of speed and pressure, the more waste of energy there is affecting the pressure recovery. Two, if the shock enters the intake, it may bounce off the walls and reach the engine compressor, where it can disrupt the flow to such an extent to limit the engine thrust, or even create vibration and ruptures. To obtain a weaker shock and control its position, air intakes have been equipped with mobile cones, ramps or wedges, whose purpose was to generate an oblique shock weaker than a straight shock and control its position. All these devices have been working well for decades, but the DSI may be considered an improvement. If we place a smooth elongated bump in front of the intake, the frontal surface of the bump acts as a compression surface and in supersonic condition it will generate an oblique shock. The effect of the compression though will be such to force the boundary layer on the side of the bump and away from it. A new boundary layer will form on the bump, but it will be much thinner than the boundary layer began developing from the news of the aircraft, hence it won't subtract much energy if ingested. The ESIs are often slanted forward, like on the F-35, to let the deviated boundary layer bleed from the sides. Since the SIs do not have moving parts, they really can't control the position of the shock, but the proper shaping of the bump can greatly reduce the strength of the shock, basically making it thicker and mitigating the problem. Just remember the term isentropic shock for when we are going to discuss the intakes. The SIs have a sweet spot in which they behave at their best and they lose efficiency at lower or higher speeds. The key point is that, in practice, the sweet spot can be between Mach 1 and Mach 1.3, where the pressure recovery improvement against an intake with no bump can be up to 6 or 7%, while the performance above and below are basically the same as a normal intake. An intake with a mobile device could be more efficient in a larger range of speeds, but the DSIs are way less complex to be designed and built, they do not require a control system to be operated, and they are much, much lighter because they have no moving parts, and the drag they generate is even slightly lower. In modern fighters, where speed is less than a concern that it was in the 60s or the 70s, they are not at disadvantage at all. No surprise that they have been chosen for the F-35. There is also a final consideration. The bump on the intake is partially screening the engine compressor, which is a very strong source of rudder returns, and the intake itself is more stealthy than a conventional intake. There are fewer lines and surfaces that can reflect the radar. The Chinese adopted them on various planes, including the J-10, and it's no surprise that they have been chosen for the JF-17 too. Hey, if you enjoyed this video, I'm sure you will like the videos that are going to appear beside me. In the meanwhile, please like, dislike, subscribe and hit the bell so you won't miss anything. And uh, if you could actually consider supporting the channel on Patreon or Subscribestar, that would be amazing. In the meanwhile, thank you very, very much for watching and see you in the next video.